Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's clinical webcast, getting the most out of the holiday report on the Pinacam for cataract and refractive surgery. Prior to tonight's webcast, you should have received an email with a couple items. One is the holiday report interpretation guidelines, and the other is a handout specifically for tonight's webcast. If for any reason you don't have those, you can actually download them on the right side of your screen in the handout section. If you have any questions during tonight's presentation, I encourage you to put them in the question section on the right side of your screen, and we will conclude tonight's session with a Q&A. Tonight's speaker is well known to eye care professionals throughout the world for his IOL calculation formulas, as well as the numerous publications in ophthalmology journals and countless lectures given around the world. On behalf of Oculus, I'd like to say that it is an honor to have Dr. Holiday here to talk about the Holiday Report on the Pinacam. And at this time, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jack Holiday. Uh, thank you, Chris, for having me tonight. And it indeed it is uh, to uh, speak with you tonight. And uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about, as we said, is going to be the holiday report uh, on the Pentagon. All right. And these are uh, Oculus is. Uh, one of the companies that I consult with, uh, which has sponsored this tonight. And uh, the handouts, if you don't download these as we're on the webinar tonight, are also available on my website at hicksoak.com. And the handouts that you want to get and the presentation uh, are these first two right here. And it's really important that you get the interpretation guidelines because the guidelines actually do uh, go through every detail about what we're going to talk about tonight and i've spent a lot of time trying to make sure that that's very clear uh, so that all of you will understand uh, what we're talking about now the first thing is that the version that you need to have on your panicam is version 1.20 build 97 or higher so when you look on your panicam if you don't have build 97 or higher then some of the things that we're talking about tonight will not be present because you need that bill to be able to have uh, all of that information and have the right version. Now, one of the things we've done in the last two years is to set the holiday report so you don't have to worry about any of the settings. So the main color bar settings, the uh, overlays, and all of those things have been sent. And the reason for that is this. This is a map that was recently sent to me by uh, one of the doctors asking questions about that patient. And as you'll see tonight, when we're talking about green colors are normal, yellow colors are suspicious, and red colors are bad. And so what you see here is when you look at that map, you say to yourself, well, gee, everything looks great. Now, the same exact map with the settings properly is this right here. They're the, exactly the same maps, except the settings for uh, the topography are where they should be at a half a diopter and one diopter for the tangential map, the sensitivity for corneal sensitivities at 20 microns and 2%, and the elevations are at two to three microns for the fact front and the back surface. So you see that if you don't have the settings right, what happens is you end up with something that you can't interpret. So every time you load a, a holiday report, these settings will automatically be there. So everyone will be looking at exactly the same map. Now you can change the settings by going to the right, uh, going to a color bar and right clicking and making a change. But every time you load them, they will be exactly the same. Okay. Now, let's see here. Now, and so you don't have to lock the settings because they're already locked. And then, as I said, the overlays, uh, that is what should be shown on the screen, such as the apex of the cornea where it's thinnest, the uh, center of the cornea, the center of the pupil and the edge, all of the things that need to be set on here are are automatically done on the holiday report uh, with the latest versions. Now, 
the layout that you see here is set up so that if you have an electronic medical record or whatever, that you can have this PDF in front of you and it has all the information because I know that as a physician, you don't have time to sit at the instrument and flip through several reports. So we've laid out the report so everything you need to know is on the first or second page of the report. The demographic information is up in the first window. The K reading information that we'll talk more about is in the middle window up here along with the spherical aberration. Uh, this is important for IOL calculations, selection for aspheric lenses, and we'll talk more about these. And then on the right upper window are parameters uh, that relate to the map. Pupil diameter, the white-to-white, -white, pachymetry mem, uh, the estimated preoperative uh, corneal power before refractive surgery, the ACD depth, and then cord mu. Now, we're going to talk about all those in a moment, but that's where they're located in the upper right. Then on the uh, maps, there are six. The first column are topography maps with a P, topography. So this is the axial fire map that you're used to looking at and the tangential map. In the second column, that we have corneal thickness and relative pachymetry, which we'll talk about. And in the third column, we have elevations above a reference surface, which we use the uh, toric ellipsoid of, in front of the elevations on the front and on the back surface. So this is the overall layout that we have uh, on the maps. Now, the parameters in that upper right window are the pupil size, the pupil diameter, and of course the pupil diameter is going to be in between mesopic and photopic conditions because the light is fairly bright when the measurements are taken. So we expect these to be not six or seven millimeter dilated pupils like they would be in low mesopic. They're down around three and a half. And then it tells where that pupil is relative to vertex normal. Now vertex normal is the first Purkinje image or the light reflex that we see, and that is within a few microns of the visual axis. And if so, everything is relative to that. So we know the center of the pupil is temporal to that first Purkinje image. We know that the white to white, the corneal diameter, uh, is also temporal, that is the center. Uh, well, this is what it's telling us where the center is. The pachymetry min is also temporal to the light reflex. So these X and Y positions that are shown over here are the location of the diameter of the pupil, the corneal center, and the pachymetry min relative to that first Purkinje image. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Now, the estimated pre-refractive K reading is used in IOL power our calculations for people that have had refractive surgery because it always asks you what were the K readings before refractive surgery and what are they now and that difference uh, we can calculate so we can give you that from knowing the back and front ratio of the cornea. Now in this patient you see it's a quarter of a doctor 0.2 so this patient hasn't had refractive surgery but if they had this might say minus eight uh, which was the refractive change. Then the anterior chamber depth. Well, you need those for the newer formulas today. The Olson, the Barrett, the Holiday 2 all use anterior chamber depth, so this value is right here. And then cord mu is the distance from the center of the pupil to vertex normal. And that value we'll talk more about, but that should always be less than about four tenths of a millimeter. Uh, in order for it to, uh, for the patient, say, to do well with a, uh, to do well with a uh, diffractive multifocal lens. All right, so those are the parameters that we'll be looking at. Now, I have some tables that are in the presentation and in the uh, interpretation guideline, and those tables we don't need to go through, but they give you normative values. But again, you don't need to worry yourself with that because we've taken that into account with the color maps. So when they're green, they're gonna be normal. When they're red, they're abnormal. And when they're yellow, they're suspicious. 
So you may want to look at these tables because they have all of the normative data for the things that we're going to look at in the map. Uh, and then this last one tells you about for prolate corneas what the spherical aberration is of the cornea. But again, you don't have to worry about those values because the color codes on the maps automatically take care of that. So let's take a look at one here. Now, the first thing you look up are at the K reading. So in this patient, the average K reading is 40.76. Now, this value up here in this middle window at the top is called the equivalent K reading 65. We call it for short the EKR 65. The EKR 65 is the value that is what you would use for K readings on a patient that was going to have cataract surgery. It takes into account the back and the front uh, surface of the cornea, and it takes into account uh, basically all the factors that you need to know in order to come up with a uh, power for uh, cataract surgery to determine the right intraocular lens. Now, the four and a half millimeter zone will have the best correlation with uh, K readings of a 3.2 or 3.0 diameter because the four and a half millimeter zone takes everything within that four and a half millimeter zone. And of course, the keratometer takes one ring at 3.2 or 3.0 or 2.5, depending on the keratometer. But the point is, the four and a half millimeter zone has been shown to be the best for people with normal pupils. The astigmatism, which is right here, 1.31 in this patient, is also the best uh, value to use uh, because it gives you what the uh, power is, uh, the astigmatic power, uh, in that patient. So what we have is an astigmatic power of 1.31 diopters, and that's what you would use in your uh, uh, when you put in these two Ks for your calculation of a toric lens. Now, the other parameter that's right up here is 0.398. Now, the average value in a patient is about 0.27, so this patient has more spherical aberration than average. And this allows you to choose the um, aspheric lens. So uh, the lenses from B&L are zero, Asphericity, the ones from Alcon are minus 0.18, and the ones from AMO are minus 0.27. So in this patient, you would, if you were trying to match the asphericity to get the best result, the AMO would be the highest value, would give the best result. Now, uh, the pupil values and things over here, we look at this chord mu and we see it's 0.3. And that means it's less than 0 0.4. 0 0.4 is the value above which, with shine flu, that you need to be careful about placing uh, a diffractive multifocal lens in, because what this is saying is the light reflex, the visual axis, and the pupil center are three tenths of a millimeter apart. Well, that's okay. But as it gets over 0.4 millimeters on shine plug, the performance of a multifocal lens goes down, and the result is that the uh, patient complains of waxy vision or, or, or halos and glare, so they don't work out good. The other value that you see right here is this pachymetry center right here. Uh, in this patient, that pachymetry min is 0.75 millimeters below and 0.82 millimeters uh, inferior. Well, that, uh, that value is uh, at 0.82, a little bit on the high side. So when we look at that, we'll see that one of the characteristics we look at in keratoconus is that pachymetry min being decentered inferiorly but we see no red powers down here, nothing suspicious on the relative pachymetry map, and the elevation map looks normal on the front, and we do see some elevations here uh, on the front surface, but they're in yellow. So again, I'm not worried about this patient because there's not any reds, and particularly because they have a uh, fairly symmetric um, 
axes on these semi meridians. Now, that's one other thing that you should look at if you're looking at a toric lens. These axes in the three and the five millimeter zone should be fairly orthogonal and fairly straight. You shouldn't see much of breaks, and this one doesn't have very much. But if you see a lot of breaks in here, then a toric lens is not going to perform as well because the patient has some irregular astigmatism. All right. Now, as we look at the uh, next picture, let's go over here. All right. Yeah. The second page gives you the exact values again for the one all the way up to the seven millimeter zone for the K readings. And so here we see 40.76, 40.58, 40.54, and we see all the way from three to four and a half millimeter zone that the power changes less than a quarter of a doctor. So we know that this is a good value for us to use. Now, if this had dropped all the way down to say 39 and a half, well, then you might want us, uh, if the patient has a small pupil, use a little bit smaller optical zone because the cornea is getting flatter and flatter as you move to the center. And we can see here that the main power, this power distribution here, has a power that is maximum at this point. Uh, but it does have a little peak over here, too. So the EK65 takes all of that into account. Now, thinning disorders. For those of you that do refractive surgery, this is extremely important because you don't want to operate on somebody that you think will ultimately lead to an ectasia. And these are the four things that you want to look for. And what we see here is, first of all, the vertical location of the pachymetry mid. What you see here is that uh, the vertical location of the thinnest part of the cornea is on the average about a 0.11 millimeters below uh, the first Rakenji image. So this is something to keep in mind. Now, there are people that have values that are bigger than that than are normal, but again, we take all four of these into account. But the average is 0.11, so two standard deviations from the normal, 16 would be uh, 37. So what we are 27. So what we would see if it gets down over three tenths of a millimeter below the center, that patient is really abnormal. Now the hot spot on the topography mats, a hot spot on the pachymetry. In other words, hot spots so anywhere along that bottom or top row are things that we worry about. So let's take a look here, all right? So we look up here and we see the K readings, fairly normal, average 42.63. We see when we look right here that that thin spot, when we look up here at pachymetry min, is almost 1.07 millimeters inferior to the light reflex and dead center below. It's not a little bit on the temporal side like it should be. And then we look down here at the bottom and we see this red zone on the tangential map, a red zone on the axial map. The thinnest point here on this relative pachymetry map is 4.6. Now let's talk about what this relative pachymetry map is. The corneal thickness map as shown here uh, is just in microns over here on the side. So you see in yellow, we've got 560 microns in the center and it gets uh, thicker as we go out, as in the normal cornea. But the relative pachymetry map tells us what the percentage thicker or thinner the cornea is of what it should be at that point. So theoretically, all of these values should be zero uh, in that they are the proper thickness here and in the center. So it tells us zero means that it's the normal thickness everywhere. Now. This yellow at minus 0.46 is telling us that the cornea is basically thinner than normal at this specific point. And it agrees with the hot spot that we had on the tangential map, and it agrees with this elevation of 25 microns on the posterior float. Now notice that on the anterior float, it's only nine microns. Now why is there such a difference? And the reason is the cornea 
is flattened out on the front surface by the upper lid that rubs off a couple of in epithelial cells. So it only takes two epithelial cells that are eight microns uh, thick to remove 16 microns, and then all of a sudden it goes from 16 down to nine. So the back surface is a much more sensitive place to pick up the uh, thinning uh, on the cornea and the elevation than on the front because of that uh, rubbing that occurs from the upper lid. So what we see is with that one millimeter below normal, a hot spot here, a suspicious spot there, and an elevation here, uh, in my mind, this is clearly uh, keratoconus, even though the diagnosis was suspicious. Then we look at the other eye and we see, well, here, look at that, 1.34 below vertex normal, highly abnormal. A true hot spot down here and down here. Now we're up to 6.1% normal and 38 microns. So there's no question that this is a person with keratoconus and it just turns out that the left eye is much more severe than the right eye. But those four parameters, an inferior location of the thinnest part of the cornea, well, over we said four tenths of a millimeter, this is one, and then hot spots on the bottom row along uh, the lower row of the map. Okay, and again, uh, we look here and look at this. Well, now we have to look at this. Okay, we look at the topography maps and we see red zone over here. And then we see that the cornea is actually flat inferiorly. And then we see this uh, thin area down here. But when we look over on the corneal thickness map, what we see is that the thinnest part of the cornea is actually up here. And then we do see some hot spots down here and a hot spot down here. Well, when we look at that, this has a characteristic uh, sign, which is called a crab claw. And the crab claw is something that we see in uh, pollution marginal degeneration. And what's happening is right along this inferior border of the cornea, the cornea begins to thin and it lifts up a little bit. And it usually occurs a little bit more in the exposure zone because the lower lid is coming right along here. And so the exposure zone, in addition to the thinning that happens inferiorly, makes these areas often worse. So we get this crab claw, this little crab claw appearance on both the uh, sagittal and the tangential map. And then, of course, the thinnest area is actually right along this border where this is lifting off. The cornea actually lifts off as it gets thinner, and it causes this uh, red appearance down here. The thinnest and worst area is right down at the bottom. And then, of course, on the elevation map, again, because that's bulging out inferiorly, it actually causes this to turn red down here at the bottom. So this is a fairly typical uh, example of pellucid marginal degeneration. And uh, here's the same thing, but it's just more severe in the left eye. We get this crab claw appearance again. We do see that here uh, it's gotten so thin inferiorly that it actually displaces it. But the location of the thinnest point in pellucid is not uh, something that you can depend on because it's just because the actual problem is happening down here on the lower inferior part of the border of the cornea. And once again, we see this large elevation uh, from it bulging out from this thin area as that lifts off. So again, this is just another example of pellucid marginal degeneration. Now, another thing, and again, we look up at the map, we see the K readings are very flat. Uh, we look over uh, at the uh, Cord mu, and we see, well, gee, it's pretty normal, 0.2. That's much less than 0.4. We look uh, here, and we see a very thin area that's dead in the center of the uh, cornea. Well, it's actually a little bit uh, temporal in this right eye. It would be centered on this light reflex or centered on the pupil if it had been centered perfectly. 
We look down here though, and we see that the actual center of the thinnest part of the relative pachymetry map is almost dead center with the pupil. Then we look over here and we see that this person has uh, a fairly normal front surface in terms of the elevation, but the back surface is 14 microns above the reference. Well, when it's that high, uh, that's an indication of ectasia. And this is an example of a person that's had uh, post-LASIK. And in this right eye, they have an ectasia, and that's confirmed by this elevation of the posterior surface. If that were an ectasia, this would be the same as it is on the anterior. It'd be about minus eight. So this is somebody that uh, has had an ectasia and uh, needs to have cross-linking or something done because that's going to get even worse. Now, you also see here that uh, in the center of that cornea, they have a fairly consistent power. And when we look up here, we see that that's uh, 3582, 64, but 3530. So that's almost a half a doctor. And actually, if we go back, let's go back to that previous picture. And what it says up here is, gee, this refractive change was minus 11.4, and this person had a 49.1 diopter cornea. Well, I don't believe that's true. I think that the ectasia had something to do with that. But the fact is, again, this is where you'd get the values if you were trying to determine what the K reading was before the person had refractive surgery. And again, they have a fairly uniform power. Now, the point is for IOL calculations, the equivalent K reading or the EKR65 takes into account both the front and the back cornea and converts those values to something that's used in standard formulas today. If you use net power, you'll end up with a, a cornea power that's about a diopter less than uh, the true equivalent power, and the result will be that you'll underestimate the power of the cornea by about a diopter, and you'll end up with a myopic surprise. So the EKR value gives you a little bit better result. Now, what the EKR value does is it takes the front surface power and the difference in the back surface power from normal and then computes uh, what the equivalent 65 power would be. And basically, again, it's about a diopter to a diopter and a half uh, higher than the net power, and if you put a net power in any of the formulas today, you'll end up with a myopic surprise because they don't expect net power. Now, uh, in this case, when we look, this patient has 1.76 diopters of astigmatism, but when you look at this, look very closely. You see how the uh, steep meridian is not a straight line. And basically, it's saying that it's 1.76, and the axis is 74 and 164. Now, these are always orthogonal. It tries to come up with the best K reading as it can, and they have to be orthogonal. But when you look up here, what you see is that this value right here, which is about 70, but when you look down here, you see that that should be coming right down here about 245 degrees, and it's not. This patient has a skewed astigmatism, and all these breaks in the line simply mean that if you try to correct that person with the 1.76 diopters of astigmatism, you should expect that their outcome is not going to be 2020, 2016. They're going to have a reduction because they have an irregular astigmatism, and that irregular astigmatism is from the skewed orthogonal non-orthogonal meridians. Now, everything else looks good. They uh, basically, everything else is fine. But the other thing we look up at there, their cord mu is 0.29. So that's okay. I said 0 0.4 is the value where you want to be careful. All right. So that's where you get your K readings for IOL power calculations and stuff. And again, that spherical aberration in this patient was 
the average is 0.27, so this is a little higher than normal. But again, these are the values, and Koch study showed you don't only want to use the Z40 term, you want to use the Z40 plus the 60 plus the 80 because those three together give you the total spherical aberration in an eye, and that's what the lens is going to try to correct. All right, now, uh, again, a cone does not uh, always have to be way down inferiorly. So in this patient, again, we see this inferior displacement. We see a hot spot on the cornea. We see 7.1% thinner than normal and 19 microns, which is red. So this, again, is a person with keratoconus. Uh, and... Uh, is someone that if you were trying to do, if say their vision was down from a cataract and you had decided that you wanted to operate on this person. Well, uh, the K readings that you get from a person with keratoconus, the K readings always measure up in this central zone, so they're always too high. The patient doesn't look through this. They look through the paracentral zone. So for keratoconus in an IOL calculation, what we recommend is, again, the EKR65, and this value uh, in this patient for the EKR65, their actual peak up here is about 45 because that's the cap. But their actual power that we recommend for the EKR65 is 42 and a half, way down here because they're not looking through this cap by itself. And the EKR65 gives you the best value for a K reading in a person with keratoconus. It also works in anybody with irregular astigmatism. So the post-refractive surgery patient, post-PKP, keratoconus, corneal scar, and any cause of irregular astigmatism, patients will have the best results with that EKR65. And this is just to show you why the EKR65 in a normal person, the peak is the same as you'd get with the keratometer. But in a LASIK patient or an RK patient, because of the distribution in power, the it's much more complicated to get a power that's correct, and that EKR65 does it. All right, so um, again, in a cataract patient that's had uh, refractive surgery, then you want to be very careful to use that EKR65. And again, here's an example where it gives you the preoperative case of 46.6, what the refractive change has been. This person does have an optical zone that's almost 0.5 millimeters from the vertex normal. Now, what that tells you is that this person is going to have some trouble uh, with the multifocal lens. And, of course, the... Um, post-refractive surgery patients, optics are not as good. So all that's saying is the location of the pupil, the location of vertex normal, and the irregularity that you see there are all things that would indicate probably a multifocal lens would not be the best choice. And here it's showing the bifocal power of the cornea. You notice that it's got two peaks here. And so once again, you have to be careful, and that EKR65 takes all of that into account. All right, so when we look at that, uh, the EKR65, and again, if you look at the four and the three millimeter zone and they're much flatter and the patient has a smaller pupil, well, then I would probably go down to a little bit flatter cornea and maybe use the uh, 4.0 millimeter to be able to get the right values. Now, another thing that we've uh, been able to incorporate is uh, the Pentacam AXL has uh, incorporated axial length measurements, and which uses OCT along with the Shine Fluke measurement. And what happens is it allows you then to be able to do IOL power calculations to get the axial length, and it's using Shine Fluke and axial length measurements OCT. So. Uh, all of you are familiar with how uh, OCT optical biometry works, and we trust those in people, and now uh, the software has the ability to be able to do the IOL calculations 
And so uh, all of that stuff's in the uh, uh, guidelines that shows you how to do the calculation on the AXL. Now, in addition to that, one of the things that we've done is that we've been able to um, incorporate this in to the IOL consultant, the holiday IOL consultant. And what you see down here is we've always been able to import from the optical bombers, and now we can import from uh, the Pentacam AXL. And what it does is you just click on that, you go down and you find where your Pentacam is on your network, and then it automatically imports all of the values that you've got into the consultant program so that you can do the calculation uh, without having to do any manual entry. So this has been imported from the Pentacam with the axial length and all the values that are in there. Uh, and so it does that automatically. And then it allows you to use uh, one of the later generation formulas like the Holiday 2 uh, that are available today so you can double check your calculations and stuff. So uh, we've got about 20 minutes to answer any questions uh, that anyone may have. So uh, let's see what kind of questions we have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Holiday. <clears throat> and just real quick before we get to the questions, uh, if you don't mind, um, if anybody has any questions about tonight's webinar or uh, any questions about Oculus products at all, you can always contact us at the 800 number shown here or at sales at oculususa.com. Uh, if you missed part of tonight's lecture or you would like to view any past lectures, you can also go to one of the two websites listed here where we have prior lectures in our webcast section. Uh, and then the last thing, don't forget to visit the Oculus booth at ASCRS. Uh, we'll be at booth number 1647. And so thank you very much, Dr. Holiday, for that presentation.